Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. Minorities in Pakistan suffer due to draconian blasphemy laws. Gender discrimination rampant during two years of Taliban rule in Afghanistan. And people in Jammu and Kashmir choose peace over violence. Let's begin the show. Minorities in Islamic Republic of Pakistan have been suffering due to draconian blasphemy laws. They are being targeted on false allegations time and again. And blasphemy laws are unfortunately misused and abused over the years across Pakistan. Rather than protecting the vulnerable, Pakistan is using blasphemy as a tool to target religious minorities, leading to grave consequences. We have a special report. The Faisalabad city of Pakistan's Punjab witnessed a distressing incident of enraged mob, vandalizing multiple churches over blasphemy allegations. The violent incident on August 16 was reported over reports of the alleged desecration of religious scriptures by two local Christian residents. Over half a dozen churches in the area were ransacked and burnt, and the security forces remained mere spectators. Christian residents of the area fled for fear of attack. Local mobs raised slogans in favor of the Tehrik al Abbaq, Khatme Nabuat, apart from demanding the execution of the culprit. The mobs later gathered at Mehtab Masjid near Cinema Chowk. <laughs> Pakistan's blasphemy laws, which can already mean death for those deemed to have insulted Islam or the Prophet Muhammad, can now also be used to punish anyone convicted of insulting people who were connected to him. Those accused of blasphemy against Islam risk becoming targets of mob justice, fatally tortured or shot by angry mobs before legal proceedings can play out. In many cases, the accusations have arisen out of personal enmities or feuds over land. The draconian blasphemy laws are being misused against political opponents also. In 2011, Salman Tasir, the governor of Punjab province, was fatally shot by one of his own bodyguards. Tasir was an outspoken opponent of the blasphemy laws and had campaigned for the release of Asiya Bibi, a Christian convicted of insulting the Prophet Muhammad. Shahbaz Bhatti, a federal minister and a Christian who had also opposed the death sentence to Asiya Bibi, was fatally shot the same year. Many secular governments in Pakistan have tried to make amendments in blasphemy laws but failed. Blasphemy laws have traditionally existed for one reason and one reason alone, which is uh, political. Uh, uh, and very frequently personal as well in uh, uh, medieval Europe because you know the lending of money uh, usury as it's called was not allowed uh, Jews used to be the target of every uh, uh, sort of blood libel rumor uh, uh, by a, uh, a debtor who could not repay his debt uh, today you know it's uh, it's a slightly different dynamic but very similar it's usually politically motivated in some form or the other uh, where uh, you want to hide your own uh, culpability. In January 2022, the Center for Research and Security Studies in a report stated that as many as 89 citizens were killed in 1,415 accusations and cases of blasphemy in the country since independence. The report said that from 1947 to 2021, 18 women and 71 men were extrajudicially killed over blasphemy accusations. 
The allegations were made against 107 women and 1,308 men. Out of the total, 1,287 citizens were accused of committing blasphemy from 2011-2021. The report had said misuse of blasphemy laws is often described by courts as an unlawful act. It had said that Islamabad High Court had previously suggested to the legislature to amend the existing laws to give equal punishment to those who level false blasphemy accusations. The report had said the origin of the blasphemy laws dated back to the British era when these were promulgated in 1860. Pakistan inherited these laws when it came into existence after the partition of India in 1947. Between 1980 and 1986, a number of clauses were added to the laws by the military government of General Ziaul Haq. He wanted to Islamize them and also legally to separate the Ahmadi community, declared non-Muslim in 1973, from the main body of Pakistan's overwhelmingly Muslim population. Since then, the minorities in Pakistan have been suffering due to draconian blasphemy laws. Moving on, it's been two years since the Taliban took over Kabul on August 15, 2021. The event changed the South Asian nation in many ways, with the most profound impact being experienced by the Afghan women. The hardliners have deprived millions of Afghan women of their right to education, ousted tens of thousands of women from jobs, and banned women businesses and all sorts of activism. They have trampled on Afghan women today and forced them into dark ages. A report. 15th August marks two years since the Taliban group stormed back to power in Afghanistan. In just two years, the Taliban have erased two decades of progress, relegating women to second-class citizenship. When the United States struck a deal with the Taliban, the group promised that the women in the country would be allowed to exercise their rights within the confines of Sharia law. However, contrary to what they promised, the Taliban have systematically excluded women and girls from public life. Women are now banned from working in most government jobs and from attending school beyond the sixth grade. They are required to wear the burqa in public and are not allowed to travel without a male chaperone. They have been attacked for speaking out against the Taliban and many have been forced to flee their homes. Experts believe the Taliban's actions are a violation of international law and human rights. They are also a setback for Afghanistan, which was making progress in improving the lives of women and girls. On the second anniversary of the Taliban's return to power, Gordon Brown, UN Global Education Envoy, urged that the International Criminal Court ICC, should recognize the gender discrimination in Afghanistan as crime against humanity. It is exactly two years since the return of the Taliban to power, and it's two years since the start of a new repression I'm here to salute and pay tribute to the determination, the courage and the resilience of Afghan girls and Afghan women, who even as millions of them are suffering poverty and hunger, have been fighting the most egregious, vicious and indefensible violation of women's rights and girls' rights in the world today. The legal opinion we have received shows that the denial of education to Afghan girls and employment to Afghan women is gender discrimination, which should count as a crime against humanity, and it should be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. And so today, the international community must step up its efforts to restore the freedom of girls to go to school, women to university, to work, to walk in public places, and to enjoy basic liberties, and end what many have called gender apartheid against girls and women. Before the Taliban came to power in 2021, women in Afghanistan had made significant gains in education, employment and political participation. 
The literacy rate for women had increased from 17% in 2001 to 30% in 2021. The number of girls in school had increased from 2 million to 9 million. And women held 27% of seats in the Afghan parliament. These gains were hard won and came at a great cost. Many women and girls were killed or injured by the Taliban or other armed groups. But despite the challenges, Afghan women preserved and made significant progress in their right for equality. Today, Afghanistan is the only country where girls are banned from going to schools. A recent analysis by the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, found that prohibiting girls from attending high school also has a financial cost, costing the nation 2.5% of its annual GDP. According to UNICEF, if the 3 million girls in the current cohort finished secondary school and entered the workforce, the Afghan economy would grow by at least 5.4 billion US dollars. However, it appears that under the current circumstances, their contribution is headed towards zero. This is the worst example of the abuse of human rights against girls and women around the world. And if we allow this to happen and continue with impunity, then others may try to do exactly the same. And we cannot allow the message to be sent out that we, uh, there is any equanimity, there is any moral equivalence about uh, allowing uh, girls to be denied these rights. We are determined that these girls have these rights. The Taliban regime has failed to earn recognition from any UN member state because of their rigid and intransigent mode of governance. Their inability to transform their mindset on issues such as women's freedom. The Taliban government should understand that a country can't survive in the 21st century by pursuing a retrogressive and ultra-conservative approach. The eventual outcome of suppressing the freedom and creativity of women will be the erosion of Afghan society. Banning women's movements, curtailing all their freedom, health and education will augment frustration and anger among the Afghan women. Let's shift our focus to Balochistan, the largest and resource-rich province of Pakistan, where nationalist movement is continuing. The Baloch have been fighting Pakistan operation politically and with arms. As Pakistan army has intensified its operation against the Baloch freedom fighters, they are also facing counterattacks. Recently, an alarming incident has highlighted the escalating conflict in the region. A convoy of Chinese nationals fell victim to an attack by armed rebels in the city of Gwadar. We have a report. August 16, a convoy of engineers was attacked in the port city of Gwadar in Pakistan. The attack inflicted 13 casualties, including four Chinese nationals. Baloch Liberation Army or BLA, an armed rebel group in the region, claimed responsibility for the attack. BLA calls itself the armed front of the secessionist Balochistan movement, seeking independence from Pakistan. They even released the name of two of its members who carried out the attack, Navid Baloch and Makbul Baloch. This situation highlights the escalating conflict in the area and the BLA's increased targeting of Chinese nationals. the Baloch militant organization, the Baloch armed group, uh, the Baloch Liberation Army or the Balochistan Liberation Front, they say, this is what they believe, they say that China is supporting our occupier. China is actually uh, strengthening the uh, weakened Pakistan. Without the help of China, without the uh, aid of China and the other countries around the world, Pakistan cannot survive. But Pakistan is surviving and they're continuing their brutality in Balochistan with the support and aid of China. That is why they are attacking the Chinese uh, in Balochistan. The BLA has stepped up its attacks on Chinese nationals because they ignored warnings not to make deals with Pakistan about Balochistan. 
In April last year, a female suicide bomber of BLA killed three Chinese teachers in Karachi. In 2021, a bus with Chinese engineers exploded, causing the death of 13 people, including nine Chinese engineers. The group claims that China's involvement has adversely affected the Baloch people by exploiting natural resources without considering local needs. The Chinese investment, it's not for the Baloch people. It's in reality, not even for the Punjab. What China is looking for is squadron port. China wants to strengthen its military power. China wants to strengthen its military growth in the region by controlling the Gwadar port. If China controls squadron port, they can control Middle East from there. And with that, China will become, you know, the regional power. And obviously, uh, what China has in their mind to become the next superpower, or as they claim, they are already on that path. And for the people of Balochistan, there is nothing in these uh, huge, as you say, uh, projects. Balochistan's history is marked by regular insurgencies following Pakistan's annexation of the autonomous Baloch state of Kalat in 1948. Baloch groups have consistently clashed with Pakistani security forces, demanding their rights and autonomy for ethnic Baloch regions who complete freedom from the clutches of Islamabad. Balochistan was a free land. Balochistan was a land that was free for at least seven months when the British Empire left the subcontinent. Balochistan has never been part of India. Balochistan has never been part of the current Pakistan historically. It has its own historical, geographical, you know, uh, boundaries. So. Pakistan, in the name of Islam, occupied Balochistan in the name of brotherhood and religion. They took over the resources of Balochistan. They took over the uh, freedom of Baloch people. And what they gave us is slavery, occupation, suppression, uh, brutality, uh, kill and dump, uh, drugs, uh, you know, religion extremism, uh, kill and dump policies, and no education, no basic uh, necessities of life, no job or no business are uh, available for the people of Balochistan. So the Baloch people are living a really sad and a really hard life. Civilians have suffered greatly from these conflicts, facing unlawful detentions and extrajudicial killings by military, police and paramilitary personnel. Global media outlets have time and again highlighted the discovery of hundreds of bodies of suspected armed separatists and political activists in Balochistan province, pointing to extrajudicial killings by Pakistani security forces. According to a recent report by Pank, the Human Rights Department of Baloch National Movement, there has been 31 torture victims, 32 enforced disappearances and three extrajudicial killings in July alone this year. Numerous projects, including mining and energy initiatives, have disproportionately benefited outsiders while depriving locals of resources and job opportunities. These grievances have fueled protests against targeted killings and false encounters, both within Balochistan and in Western countries. In the absence of enough international support, some Baloch rebels say they had to pick guns as a last-ditch effort to raise their demands and save their dignity. India's Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir has been suffering at the hands of Pakistan's sponsored terrorism for over seven decades. It was all started in October 1947, when Pakistan's Pashtun tribal militias, along with Pakistan army regulars, invaded the region and committed large-scale atrocities on the civilians. Although Pakistan occupied a large portion of the region, it continues to create instability by sponsoring terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. Now the Indian government has taken stringent actions to stop Pakistan's sinister plans and make Jammu and Kashmir as heaven on earth. Here is a report. Lal Chowk, a city square in Srinagar city of Jammu and Kashmir, 
stands as a witness to the change in the security scenario in the Union territory. On the country's 77th Independence Day, a large number of people gathered at this historic square and waved the tricolor by raising Bharat Mata Ki Jai slogans. Many tourists from other parts of the country also gathered to celebrate Independence Day without any fear of terrorists. This change has been possible with the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A in 2019. पाकिस्तान को मैं दिखाना चाहता हूँ और बोलना चाहता हूँ देखिए हम हम हथमाच में झंडा लेकर कश्मीर में हैं और देखो कश्मीर में कैसा मौसम है और कैसा ये जो पंद्रह अगस्त मनाया जा रहा है दूसरी बात जो सुकून पेल्टर्स थे आज देखो वो कहाँ पर है उनकी सोच भी बदल चुकी है और दूसरी बात आज सुकून पेल्टर्स बोलते हैं कि वो गलत रास्ता था और आज वो कोमी दारा में आ गए आज देखो वो भी हमारे साथ हैं दूसरी बात तीसरी बात जो क्लॉक टावर में जो पहले बंद हुआ करते थे दुकानें आज खुली हुई है जो बिजनेस एस्टेबल बंद हुआ करता था आज वो भी खुला है ये मोदी जी की देन है और आर्टिकल 370 के बाद ये हुआ कर क्लॉक टावर पे पहले पाकिस्तान का झंडा चढ़ाया जाता था लेकिन 370 के बाद आज हिंदुस्तान का झंडा चढ़ाया जाता है Jammu and Kashmir remained a war zone for several decades due to Pakistan's sponsored terrorism. A large number of Kashmiri youth were also misled by Pakistan in the name of religion and forced to take up arms against the Indian security forces deployed in the area. Hundreds of Indian security forces sacrificed their lives protecting the people of Kashmir from terrorists infiltrating from across the border. Addressing a well-attended function at the Bakshi Stadium, first time since 1989, Lieutenant Governor Manoj Sinha highlighted the change in Kashmir's situation and growing tourist footfall in Jammu and Kashmir. He praised the security forces for their bravery in protecting Jammu and Kashmir from the enemy. <laughs> तथा सेना के बहादुर जवानों के प्रति भी अपनी श्रद्धांजलि अर्पित करता हूं। मातृभूमि की रक्षा में उनका अद्भुत पराक्रम, असीम सौर्य एवं बलिदान आज राष्ट्रीय संकल्प बनकर इस पूरे देश का मार्गदर्शन कर रहा है। जब भी पदक तालिकाओं की सूची प्रकाशित होती है, जम्मू कश्मीर के हमारे बहादुर पुलिस के जवानों पिछले वर्ष आज ही के दिन मैंने उनके स्मृति में बलिदान स्तंभ की घोषणा की थी। श्रीनगर शहर के हृदय में बन रहे इस तीर दस्तल में वतन के दीवानों की ऊर्जा शामिल है, जो नई पीढ़ी को सही रास्ते पर चलने की प्रेरणा देगी। In recent years, security in Jammu and Kashmir has witnessed a remarkable upswing. The crackdown on corruption, the elimination of top militant commanders and the focus on generating employment opportunities have collectively weakened the insurgency's grip. The loss of civilian lives has been minimized, signaling a shift towards a more stable and secure region. The voices of detractors who had exploited the youth for their own ulterior motives have been rendered irrelevant. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.